ladies, this is a presentation on cell communication and signal transduction pathways. This is going to be a completely new topic, something we've really never touched on in general bio, so uh, please make notes as you're going through. Uh, you're going to want to watch this video, and then you're going to want to also watch the Khan, Acad uh, Khan Academy video that corresponds to um, G-protein coupled receptors. So uh, let's first talk about cell signaling. Basically, cell signaling or cell communication is just when cells talk to each other. Okay, so cells need to talk to each other to send messages to kind of um, know where the other cells are or if they need to work together to do something, it's really important that they can talk. So they can't really talk the same way we do, um, but they can talk with different molecules, okay, molecules traveling in between cells. The plasma membrane is going to play a really key role in helping facilitate this cell communication. So cell communication can be local or it can be long distance. In local cell signaling, um, different cells do different types of signaling. Prokaryotic cells um, go through a process called quorum sensing, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Eukaryotic cells could communicate by direct contact using uh, gap junctions or plasma desmata in plant cells. Uh, they could use paracrine signaling, okay, sending these message molecules um, short distances to um, different cells that are in close vicinity. Growth factors are a really great example of this. Or um, synaptic signaling is a really great one where neurotransmitters will travel through the synapse to the next neuron to send a signal. So let's look at examples of local signaling. Here's quorum sensing. Basically, the main idea for quorum sensing is that prokaryotic cells will send out um, different molecules into the environment around them. Okay, these molecules are just kind of communication molecules, and we're going to call these pheromones. So they'll send out these pheromones, and sometimes if there's enough pheromones in the, the vicinity, it'll actually cause the bacteria to turn on certain genes, and these certain genes will then have some type of cellular effect. So let's look at how this works. So if I have a couple of prokaryotic cells that are um, hanging out inside a host, okay, these prokaryotic cells naturally produce these pheromones, these communication molecules. If there's very few prokaryotic cells, there's gonna be very few pheromones. If there's more prokaryotic cells, because these prokaryotic cells are dividing, okay, they're gonna produce more pheromones. Okay? Whenever these bacteria start to actually sense other um, prokaryotic cells, pheromones, okay, they don't, really don't sense their own pheromones, they'll sense other pheromones. Whenever they sense enough of these pheromones surrounding them, this will signal um, certain genes to be expressed. So it'll turn on the expression of something like pathogenic factors or a biofilm formation or a, um, a variety of different things. It'll turn on the gene expression of the other bacterium in the area. And this will cause a specific response. In the case of pathogenic factors, when there's enough of those pheromones, okay, the bacteria will actually produce the pathogenic factors and then attack the host. Okay, so this is just um, basically helping the cells um, to make density-dependent decisions about gene expression. Um, for direct contact, okay, cells can use gap junctions, okay, or plant cells can use plasma desmata. Gap junctions are basically membrane proteins that span two cell membranes. So instead of molecules leaving through one membrane and then going into another cell through the membrane, they can just go through these gap junctions of very close cells that are in contact with each other. With plasma desmata, it's basically the same thing, but there's cell walls involved. So this um, little pathway in between cells, okay, it has to go through um, cell membranes and cell walls in order to facilitate the movement of molecules between two cells. Um, other types of local cell communication, paracrine signaling, basically inside a cell, um, remember that the ribosomes will help to produce the proteins. Okay? These ribosomes attached to the endoplasmic reticulum will, um, the endoplasmic reticulum will help with protein processing. Vesicles will leave the endoplasmic reticulum, go to the Golgi. At the Golgi, additional processing will take place. And then the Golgi will release vesicles that will fuse with the plasma membrane. When these vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane, they will secrete those protein products out into the surrounding area around the cell. These protein products, okay, they could be hormones, they could be um, 
different types of molecules for communication. We'll actually go to a target cell, okay, bind with a receptor, and then cause some cell response. A really good example of this is growth factors. So releasing these growth factors from one cell will signal um, other cells in the area to grow and divide as well. Other local signaling could be through the nervous system. So when um, these protein products are created in a nerve cell, okay, we call those neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters encased in vesicles will fuse with the cell membrane, releasing the neurotransmitters out into the synapse. The neurotransmitters will travel the distance or travel the synapse through the synapse to the next nerve cell, okay? Or it could be a muscle cell or whatever the target cell is. They'll bind with receptors and then signal the cellular response. Cells can also communicate long distances. This is particularly um, seen in the endocrine system, which we will study this year as well. Hormonal signaling. Um, hormones are specialized communication molecules that will travel long distances through the circulatory system in animals. So an endocrine cell like, um, like the pancreas, like cells inside the pancreas, will produce uh, these signaling hormones. In the case of the pancreas, they're going to produce insulin. Insulin will re be released from the cell okay, when a vesicle fuses with the cell membrane, releasing the contents into the bloodstream. These hormones will travel through the bloodstream and travel to the target tissue. Okay, if we're talking about insulin, it's going to travel to the muscle cells or the liver cells, telling those cells to absorb the excess glucose and store it as glycogen. And we'll spend some more time talking about this as well. So um, when these molecules are um, created in those cells and travel to the target cell, what actually happens? Okay, we're gonna go through signal transduction pathways. So when one of those signal molecules hits the target cell, okay, how does it actually cause the cell response? So there are three stages in cell signaling or signal transduction pathways. Um, number one, reception, two, transduction, three, response. So I'm gonna go through each one of these more specifically. Okay, this is a really important um, three-step process, so make sure you know the steps. So, number one, uh, reception. I'm going to go through a couple of different examples as I'm talking today. Uh, you are not required to know a specific example, but you are required to understand how signal transduction works. We're going to talk about G-protein coupled receptors and um, a couple of other signal transduction pathways just to kind of get you familiar. Make sure you're comfortable with the concept of reception, transduction, and response. So with reception, okay, a signal molecule is gonna bind to a receptor. Sometimes we call this signal molecule a ligand. Okay, when it binds to the receptor, and keep in mind that protein binding is very, very specific. Um, next unit, we're gonna be talking about active sites of proteins. So you're going to get at this a little bit more, but for right now, you want to think about the fact that only one type of signal molecule can bind to the receptor. It's very, very specific. When this um, signal molecule binds to the receptor, it's going to cause some type of shape change or different conformational change. So um, you can see here, okay, the signal molecule has bound to the G protein coupled receptor. That's just one example of a very common protein receptor found um, in the plasma membrane. So this um, GPCR okay, is bound to a G protein. When the signal molecule binds, okay, it's going to cause a shape change in this receptor, which will cause the cell to swap out GDP for GTP. When GTP is bound to this G protein, okay, so you can see here the purple part is the GPCR, so the receptor molecule, the G protein, okay, the G protein couple, okay, so it's just another protein that's attached. When GD, GDP is swapped out for GTP, this protein is going to be activated. And when, G protein, when the G protein is activated, Okay, you can basically think about it like an on-off switch. Okay, when it's on, the, the G protein will separate, okay, because of that conformational change, will separate from the GPCR, and it will travel typically with the, with the G protein coupled receptor. It's going to travel right along the membrane, 
to some type of secondary enzyme. Okay, this could be a variety of different things. I'm going to talk about a more specific example. It will activate this enzyme, okay, causing some type of cell response. Okay, so this is just the binding of a ligand to the receptor. Okay, when the signal molecule binds, it will activate and cause a conformational change of this membrane-bound receptor, okay, and it will cause another thing to happen. Let's talk about transduction cascade. So once a signal molecule binds to this receptor, it's usually going to activate some type of relay molecule. Okay, in the previous example, we were looking at a G protein. Okay, this could be a variety of different things depending on the type of receptor. Remember that there's tons and tons and tons of different types of receptors found in the cell membrane. So it could be a variety of different things, but it's going to activate some other molecule. And typically what happens is it's going to cause some type of transduction cascade. So this activated molecule will activate something else, and then it'll activate something else, and then it'll activate something else until you finally get to the cellular response. It's very unlikely that just activating this molecule in the membrane will actually cause the cellular response. Typically, there's a couple of steps in the pathway. And sometimes these steps will cause an amplified signal, so we'll, so that means that the cellular response will happen more quickly. Um, or um, it could happen basically with these like little on-off switches called protein kinases. So protein kinases basically transfer um, a phosphate from ATP okay, to the protein, so phosphorylating the protein. Anytime you see the word kinase, it always means that a phosphate um, that it is going to facilitate adding a phosphate group to another protein. Okay? And this typically turns on a protein and activates it. So you can see here that this activated relay molecule activated this protein kinase. This protein kinase will activate the next protein kinase. You can see the phosphate that's being transferred to this molecule, turning it on, okay, activating this protein, which will then cause the cellular response. This provides lots of steps for regulation. So there could be a step for regulation here, 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 lots of different places. Sometimes um, secondary molecules or secondary messengers are needed in order to do this regulation. For example, um, whenever we think about a, a signal molecule such as epinephrine, involved in your flight or fight response. Okay, so when you hear someone say you get an adrenaline rush because you have a release of epinephrine. Epinephrine can bind to this G protein coupled receptor. They turn the G protein on and the enzyme that will activate in the membrane is called adenylyl cyclase. Adenylyl cyclase will take turn ATP into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP will then do something. So the secondary messenger will help um, do something. Okay? It'll leave the membrane and it'll go somewhere else in the cell to carry out this response. In this case, cyclic AMP, um, sometimes it could be calcium ions, they're common secondary messengers. This one will activate protein kinase A and it'll cause a cellular response like converting glycogen to glucose, dilating skeletal muscles, or constricting smooth, muscle, muscle, smooth muscles okay, in the intestines. These are all parts of um, the adrenaline rush, okay, making sure that you have enough glucose to fight or flight, making sure your muscles are ready to go and have enough energy, okay, stopping the flow of your smooth muscles so that way you're not digesting food. Okay, You're focusing all your energy on your muscles if you need to fight or flight. Um, and just a last note, um, typically the response can be a variety of different things depending on the molecule that's being received. But a lot of times the main goal of this is to activate a transcription factor, okay? activating something in the nucleus that will turn on or off a gene, making a specific protein. That's typically the end result of a lot of these, trans, uh, these transduction pathways. Um, one thing also to note, um, this receptor does not necessarily have to be on the membrane. Sometimes they are inside. So if you have a fat soluble protein or something like that, it can actually enter in and the receptor will be found inside the cell. Just a last note, um, there are these, these mechanisms are very universal. Okay, so showing that there is evolutionary relatedness to all life. Please bring any questions or concerns with you. We will talk about this um, in more depth during class. Have a nice day, girls.